Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. My name is Rosalba Rincon, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to our virtual event uh, to meet the editorial um, Early Career Board uh, from Chemistry, a European Journal. I'm a deputy editor for Chemistry, a European Journal, and on behalf of my colleagues, Ganal Yashenko, a senior associate editor, Stuart Birdsworth, deputy editor, and Jaimo Ross, uh, editor-in-chief, we're delighted to have, have you here today and have uh, these five members of our Early Career Editorial Advisory Board with us, who will give, be giving presentations about their research. We're really looking forward to hear about what the, um, they are doing in their uh, research groups. Uh, this, I wanted to just briefly mention our sponsors. Um, this Chemistry Europe is our sponsor. It's an association of uh, 16 chemical societies from 15 countries in Europe, representing over 75,000 chemists. Okay, um, before we start with the program, I just want to let you know how um, it's going to, what the timeline is going to be like. We're going to have uh, five presentations uh, of about 15 minutes, and after each presentation, there will be a few minutes for questions um, and answers from the speakers. So if you have questions at any time, you, you can post them on the question sections of the uh, platform and I will read them at the end of each talk. Okay, our first speaker today is Jesus Campos. And I just want to give a brief introduction while he starts uh, sharing his screen. Jesus uh, obtained his PhD in organometallic chemistry at the University of Sevilla in Spain uh, with Professor Ernesto Carmona. He developed his postdoctoral research career at the universities of Yale with Robert Crabtree and Oxford with uh, Simon Aldrich. And in 2016, he moved back to his uh, hometown of Sevilla as a Marie Curie fellow. And a year later, he became a CESIC tenure researcher at the Institute for Chemical Research and was awarded with an ERC starting grant on molecular cooperative systems. In 2020, he was appointed as fellow of the Spanish Young Academy, and his research interests include all aspects of organometallic chemistry, particularly on the study of cooperative mechanisms for bond activation and catalysis. Uh, the title of his talk today is um, "Bimetallic Frustrated Lewis Pairs." Uh, pairs. And without further ado, I give the screen to Jesus. Uh, cool. Thanks, uh, Rosalba. Maybe can you? I am sharing properly the screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, I, we nice. can see your screen. Nice, perfect. So, so uh, many thanks uh, for the for the introduction, and, and many thanks for organizing this uh, event. I think it's uh, very cool that we all uh, uh, this panel of uh, early career advisory board we we can all meet among us and and show the well, our different backgrounds and and current research interests. So it's very good for us. And, and, and I hope uh, everyone out there also enjoys uh, what, what we will be discussing today. So thanks for uh, organizing it. And uh, as you said, I will be talking uh, during these uh, 15 minutes about the uh, bimetallic FLPs. And uh, this is because we, or, uh, yeah, we, we've been interested especially in bimetallic designs since I started my uh, independent career. And this is because uh, I believe that those uh, bimetallics may offer great opportunities for bond activation and catalysis that might overpass uh, those of more, maybe more traditional mononuclear systems. And this is because these bimetallics or polymetallic species, they have tunable features that are not existent in monometallic uh, versions. For example, we can tune metal-metal bond order, bond polarity, metal-metal bond distance, and we can have multi-site activations across the metal-metal bond uh, that we wouldn't have in monometallic species. And here, I'm just uh, representing a few uh, recent examples with a remarkable reactivity uh, that always uh, relies on the presence of two metals in close proximity. And in our group, we have uh, focused across uh, the, the, the broad spectrum of metal-metal uh, bond on orders from compounds with a multiple metal-metal bond, such as this uh, diamond lignum dihydrate species, which has a very, very interesting reactivity, to compounds with a single metal-metal bond, such as this platinum-silver 
uh, bimetallic adapt, which I will be talking a little bit about in the, in the following minutes, and also to the extreme case where we don't have a metal-metal bond or just a weak interaction between the metals in compounds or in designs that we could understand as bimetallic FLPs, and that is the, the special uh, thing that I will be talking about today. So, as you all will know, this uh, very apparently very simple concept of uh, frustrated Lewis pair became a revolution in the main group area because, uh, well, Stefan showed in 2006 that you could break the dihydrogen molecule doing that reversibly with a phosphine boring pair. And that was a reaction that was supposed to be exclusive of transition metals at that time. You could also implement this into catalytic cycles, hydrogenation, and a few other related transformations without the need of a transition metal. However, the reluctance of these light main group elements to accommodate other elementary reactions, such as uh, oxidative additions, migratory insertions, and so on, has so far prevented mostly the application of FLPs into more uh, exotic or sophisticated catalytic transformations. And this is one of the reasons why uh, several groups, mainly those of Was and Erker a few years later, started to introduce transition metals into uh, FLPs because you would incorporate D orbitals, available D orbitals, and then a toolkit of elementary reactions to mediate other more uh, sophisticated catalytic transformations. And around that time, also many groups realized, I'm showing just here one selected example from Figueroa, uh, they just realized that other cooperative uh, metallic uh, compounds would exhibit a behavior that could be understood in terms of uh, FLP or the FLP concept. A few years later, the first bimetallic FLP where the two components are based on transition metal was uh, developed by Borisu with this uh, platinum aluminum species. So in this context, we, we thought that it could be a, a nice target uh, to prepare a bimetallic FLP where not only uh, uh, one, where, where the two uh, components were based uh, on metals, but not just metals, but transition metals with available D orbitals. And for doing that, we have mostly focused, in the case of the Lewis acid, on this uh, gold, very bulky, uh, uh, gold fragments, very bulky because we, we use our homemade the phenyl phosphine ligands. They are very bulky phosphines and as you know well, one of the best ways of measuring bulkiness is the percentage varied volume, which is the volume occupied by a ligand in an arbitrary sphere around the metal to which uh, the ligand is coordinated. We use this uh, iridium compound as a benchmark uh, species to gosh this, uh, this uh, static bulkiness and we could obtain several trends and one thing that you can see in this graph is that our tephenyl phosphine here are uh, way bulkier or considerably bulkier than the very well known biaryl phosphines uh, developed by Bacon. And they're very bulky, that is exactly what we wanted to achieve frustration. And uh, we also see that there is a trend and although we not go into all the phosphines that we made, just remember that we have kind of a small phosphine here a medium phosphine and a big phosphine. The three of them are very big, but uh, we have a trend, and that uh, is very important for the reactivity of the resulting uh, uh, bimetallic pairs, as you will uh, see in a moment. So the first system that we investigated was this uh, gold-platinum uh, combination. Here, the platinum zero uh, is the, the metallic Lewis base uh, with, again, two very bulky phosphines to achieve frustration. And the first thing that we investigated was this equilibrium between the monometallic fragments, the full frustration, and the bimetallic adduct. And uh, in the same manner as it happens with uh, um, main group FLPs, we could modulate this equilibrium just by subtle changes on the sterics of the phosphine ligand on gold. So if we take the smaller one, the silyl one, we always go here to the bimetallic adduct. If we take the medium-sized one, the isopropyl, well, we are in a kind of equilibrium and it depends on the conditions that we move to the left or to the right. And if we go to the, to the bulkiest of all of them, the cyclopentyl one, in that case, we never reach the bimetallic adult and we are always in the fully frustrating situation. And that, as I said before, it's very important for the reactivity of these uh, systems. We have investigated, well, many, many reactions here. I'm just showing a couple of examples. The activation of dihydrogen and the activation of acetylene. 
And uh, I have to say that the bimetallic cooperation is essential because uh, neither gold or platinum do react with uh, dihydrogen, for example, but when both of them are together, the reaction, uh, well, it takes place even at low temperature just immediately. In the case of acetylene, uh, it's also very interesting that we can play, uh, we can modulate this uh, video selectivity and move between the bridging acetylide and the gold platinum vinyling. Use the small phosphine, we get 95% of isomer A. We go to the big phosphine, the cyclopentyl one, and we just reverse uh, that video selectivity and obtain the gold platinum vinyling. So these were our initial studies, and, and, and one thing that we, we, we like a lot here is that we could uh, uh, investigate by experimental and computational means the mechanism of this dihydrogen activation, and that was our final uh, proposal, where we really have a, what we call a genuine FLP mechanism, because there is no interaction between the two metals, the dihydrogen coordinates in the transition states, uh, in a side-on fashion to gold and end of fashion to platinum and the relay of electron density here in that transition state is exactly what you see in, uh, in, in phosphine boring FLPs. So from that point we have been playing with a lot of uh, Lewis acids and Lewis bases. Here I show you another example of another Lewis base, in this case of uh, rhodium, which uh, we, we moved there uh, just with an interest on CH uh, uh, functionalization. But anyways, the first thing we wanted to know is if this could behave as a, as a proper uh, uh, metallic Lewis base. So we investigated uh, its uh, reaction with a bunch of uh, metallic electrophiles. As you can see here, we could obtain a few X-ray diffraction stru structures, uh, some of them quite, uh, quite rare, I have to say. And we again obtain uh, several trends from spectroscopic and computational studies and one thing that I would like to mention is uh, one thing about the bonding in the bimetallic bonding in these uh, compounds. You may expect the main contribution is the donation of a V orbital on rhodium towards an empty orbital of the electrophile but there is also an important contribution from a, a sigma rhodium phosphorus bond towards the electrophile and a back donation from the electrophile to the sigma antibonding orbital of the rhodium phosphorus uh, sigma bond. And that is important because upon coordination to the metal, that rhodium phosphine bond weakens a lot. And that, at the end of the story, which uh, I won't go into the details today, that has prevented us from using the system to make bimetallic FLPs. But in our way, we have found another interesting thing. And it's uh, when we introduced the, the steric con constraints with our very bulky gold uh, phosphine compounds, we observed a divergent reactivity depending on the phosphine that we used. So for the small one, the silyl one, we obtained a bimetallic rhodium gold species. But for the bigger one, what we observed is a uh, quite unexpected activation of the CP star where a hydrate has migrated from the CP to the rhodium. Here it's a the very distinctive low frequency uh, proton NMR of that hydrate. And for the medium sized phosphine, we obtain a, a mixture of both of them. And that mixture eventually evolves into the bimetallic adduct, which what is telling us uh, that there is, um, there is some reversibility in the activation of the CH bond of the CP star. And this is, I believe this is important because uh, CP star is usually used as a very robust spectator ligand and, and here we are proposing that there is a reversible migration of the hydride from the metal to the CP and we postulate, postulate that that could be used as a proton relay for, uh, for doing catalysis. It was a, a reaction not known for late transition metals. We also investigated the reactivity of these bimetallic pairs. Uh, we studied polar bonds, NH bond in ammonia and OH bonds in methanol and water. And in the bimetallic adducts, we didn't observe any reactivity. However, when we went to the CP activated product here, we could activate the NH and the OH bond. And uh, it was interesting to see that the ammonia, as you can see here with the half life, ammonia was activated way quicker than methanol or water, which uh, was uh, at the beginning surprising because ammonia activation is a little bit harder because usually you make uh, Werner type compounds and that's uh, the end of the story. But this reaction with ammonia also allowed us to support our uh, proposal of, uh, of reversibility in the activation of the CP. 
because when we prepare, uh, we managed to prepare that third deuterated uh, rhodium gold analog, we did a reaction with ammonia, and uh, as you can see here, the deuterite jumps back into the CP star, and it is a hydride, a real hydride, what is uh, in the final product, so a hydride that comes from ammonia, and we get the, the also the neutral gold amido compound. Okay, so if I uh, move back to our uh, platinum base, the one that we started uh, at the beginning, we, we then also uh, wonder if we could uh, go to some simpler uh, systems. Instead of using our very, very bulky gold compound, would we make bimetallic adducts that would generate the monometallic species in solution, kind of a thermal induced frustrated Lewis pair? And we have played uh, with a lot of combinations, and here I'm just showing you reaction with uh, very small Lewis acids, copper triflate, silver triflimidate, and in this case with zinc, which uh, it's very interesting also what, that we obtained the bimetallic adduct because it was the only zinc species that gave us this. Smaller zinc species didn't coordinate, but this uh, perfluorinated one gave us the, the adduct. And it, it's also interesting the, the case of zinc because when we try the more uh, exotic zinc one, zincosine dimer, we obtain this octahedral 16 electron platinum species uh, with six CP zinc ligands that are uh, one electron ligands, or you can understand those as uh, this in an octahedral 16 electron species. Pretty. Uh, need from a, an organometallic perspective. But as I said, other Lewis adducts didn't coordinate to platinum, so we would have bimetallic species and others that do not have a metal-metal bond and maybe uh, could behave as truly uh, bimetallic FLPs for bond activation. So with this family and a few others, we have been uh, investigated the bimetallic reactivity just to show you one example, the dihydrogen, which is the classic reaction in FLP chemistry. In the case of platinum silver, again, neither platinum or silver do react with dihydrogen, but when both are together, the reaction is immediate, even at low temperature. We obtain this uh, platinum silver, ether bimetallic dihydrate. And uh, interestingly, at, in solution, we see that the two hydrates are the same by uh, dynamic uh, behavior we low down the temperature and we could obtain this pretty uh, neat uh, one proton MR spectra where we could measure or scalar couplings between all the active nuclei. But what I want to show you is that this uh, reaction with dihydrogen, we have tried with all our bimetallic combinations and we have investigated the kinetic isotopic effects. In this case, uh, that kinetic isotopic effect is, uh, well, it's a strong, it's 6.6, and that is in contrast with our gold platinum pair, where I told you it was a, a genuine FLP mechanism without contact between gold and platinum. And in that case, we obtained an experimental TA of 0.46, which also uh, correlated well with our computational studies. And what I show you, oh, sorry, what I show you now is what we have observed for other pairs that do activate dihydrogen. In the case of copper, we have, again, uh, a normal key, but in the case of zinc, terbium, europium, and lithium, we have a, an inverse kinetic isotopic effect, and these are the, the compounds in which we do not have a metal-metal bond. So if you see uh, these examples, only in the compounds where we do have a metal-metal bond, we have a normal key, and in those without a metal-metal bond, we have this inverse key. Uh, don't take this for granted because it's something that we are just starting to investigate, but we are trying to know if this very easy experimental tool, like measuring the key, could tell us uh, if a mechanism goes through a truly FLP mechanism or a more traditional bimetallic uh, or monometallic activation. But again, it's something I say a might, because might, might. It's something we are starting just to look at. Uh, and with that, I think it's uh, the fifth. 10 minutes, uh, so my conclusion is uh, we are just building bimetallic FLPs. I, I believe uh, a lot of night reactivity will come from those. For example, we have uncovered a very unconventional reactivity in the CP stars, and the final conclusion is that, in my opinion, two metals at least might be uh, better than one, and I think this is just the, the tip of the iceberg, and uh, there are so many groups uh, like doing so cool chemistry with metallics that I think it's, uh, well, it's something to see uh, very carefully in the years to come.
Uh, so I have to thank my group, all of them very, very hard workers, passionate, and, and, and well, they did all their work. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't have the time to show the things that all of them did, but I'm very proud of all of them. Um, and I have to thank my collaborators and, and funding agencies and, 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 and you for organizing this meeting. As I said, very nice, very, very good idea. So thank you. Yep. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, definitely very uh, interesting talk and, and thank you for being so mindful of the time. Um, I don't see any questions yet coming in um, in the chat or in the questions function, but I mean, you were just talking about how, how much potential and how much uh, other groups are uh, investigating. This is a relatively new field also, right, since early 2000. Uh, they've been uh, discovered. Where do you where do you see this going, or in particular in your group? Where do you see the the research direction going? Are you just uh, gonna continue investigating uh, more metals, or do you have any uh, collaborations to look for potential applications for these compounds that you are studying? Well, for, it's interesting because the I mean, bimetallics are part of the organometallic chemistry since the really, really, really early beginning. Yeah. Uh, like multiple bonds uh, from cotton, for example, the early work. This is really old chemistry. Mm -hmm. And it has evolved like uh, by jumps over the time, not in a continuous, or that's my opinion, in a continuous uh, uh, way as the mononuclear chemistry. And I think there is not new, but a renewed interest. And, uh, mm -hmm. And I, in, in our case, like merging the concept of frustration with that concept of bimetallics and using the bimetallic cooperativity, I think it's, uh, well, I think it's a cool way to, to look at. At the end, it's all the same, right? So cooperativity, uh, uh, and, and you, you see from different points of views. Uh, but you tell, you ask me where we are going. We, we are trying to build catalytic systems uh, based on this. So far in these years, we have been investigating the, the mechanism uh, the best we could to understand how uh, the cooperation works between the two metals. And now it's uh, time to implement this in, in catalytic processes. It, it, it's something we are starting to do and I will start to show uh, in the following talks. Yeah, yeah. We we look forward also to your future publications on this topic. Great. Um, so there are no questions right now, but if any, oh yeah, one just came in. <laughs> um, so we have one from Guillaume Berioni. Uh, what is the scope of small molecules which you could activate with this uh, bimetallic FLPs? Uh, we we we. Uh... Usually we use for the for the small molecule activation our strategy is uh, the Uzi strategy. Like we take everything in the lab and we throw it at the at the high metallic FLPs and we see what happens. We, we really enjoy seeing the weird peaks uh, in the NMR spectra. So we have worked with uh, small molecule oxides, nitrogen oxides, uh, CO2, SO2, CO. Uh, then we with classic organic molecules aldehydes, ketones, and unsaturated species. And with some systems, we we have um, well better results than with others. So everything that has oxygen with gold have, hasn't worked that well. But for example, we have now a very interesting chemistry going on on CO2 activation uh, in the case of iron, and copper, and aluminum. But basically, we, we are not focusing on anything precise, but on everything. And you play with the combination of the two metals, we can activate basically everything. Yeah, he says many things, very interesting scope. Uh, thank okay. you. Then uh, if anything else comes in the chat, I'll, yeah, I'll pass I'll it on to you. But uh, for now, then I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your screen. And then I'm going to ask Trevor to show I'm going to try. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. And try. Uh, what? Why I don't see how to answer? Uh, uh, we don't see your screen anymore, so it looks good. So oh, okay, I think nice. Trevor will become a presenter, and then he can share his screen. And in the meantime, I'm just gonna. Um, we can already see your screen. It just needs to be in 
presentation mode. Perfect. Um, so Trevor Hamlin obtained his um, Bachelor in Science in Biochemistry from Albright uh, College in 2010 and his PhD is from the US, sorry, and his PhD in chemistry from the University of Connecticut in, in 2015. Uh, and then he joined the theoretical chemistry department at the uh, Freie Universität uh, VU Amsterdam for his postdoctoral uh, training with Professor Matthias Bickelhaupt, which I think is uh, part of the audience today. And then he uh, secured a position as assistant professor of the tenure track uh, the same institute in 2019. Uh, currently, his research is centered on the application of state-of-the-art computational methods uh, to furnish unparalleled insight into molecular reactivity of organic, inorganic, and biochemical reactions. Mm, the title of Trevor's talk today, you can already see, is Understanding Chemical Reactivity Using the Activation Stra Strain Model, and he's going to give us an example uh, of a Lewis acid catalyzed reaction. So we're going to continue to hear a little bit about Lewis reactions now. Okay, thank you uh, for joining us, Trevor, and then the screen is all yours. Yeah, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Rosalba, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to give a talk on some of our recent research in the Theochem group, um, where we're active in understanding chemical reactivity using the activation strain model. So jumping right into it, uh, here's a roadmap of uh, where we will go today. So our group is, is very much interested in elucidating chemical reactivity and, and towards that end, we use a combined approach where we uh, pair the activation strain model with a state-of-the-art energy decomposition analysis tool. And we're very active in studying a variety of reactions. Um, we're, we're, we're interested in studying inorganic, uh, reactions, so uh, some palladium and iron catalysis, so bond activation reactions. We're active in studying organic reactions, and as Rosalba told you, I'll be telling you about the, the Diels-Alda reaction, which is a classic uh, quintessential reaction in organic chemistry. We're also interested in studying biological reactions, um, and that entails, say, the key steps in uh, DNA replication. However, uh, given the time constraints, I will unfortunately not be able to talk about some of our catalysis work or, or the biological chemistry. So we'll just focus on this one reaction here. And the Diels-Alder reaction, uh, here you see the scheme. So it's a four plus two Diels-Alder uh, yeah, cycloaddition that takes place between a diene and a dienophile. And in one concerted step, you form a six-membered cycloadduct. And uh, the reaction is uh, a concerted reaction whereby in the transition state, you have a cyclic flow of electrons. So this is a classic paracyclic reaction. And now I'll talk about uh, the activation strain model, which is the tool that we'll use to study this classic reaction. So typically when you wanna study a reaction, you assemble a potential energy surface whereby you find the key stationary points. Typically, you begin with finding the reactants, you'll find your products, and then you'll have to find the transition state that links these two stationary points. And one can wonder, what, why do you have a barrier in the first place? Or if you have multiple reactions, why are some reactions faster than others? And uh, luckily, we have uh, some really nice tools to study this. So in the diels alder reaction, here you have the optimized reactants before they've encountered each other. And you see they're nicely planar. And here you see the structure of the cycloadduct. So there's been significant reorganization of the geometry. OK. So the activation strain model posits that the activation barrier is equal to the sum of the strain plus the interaction energy. So now let's visualize this. So in the Diels-Alder reaction, um, we can imagine that the strain energy, which is the energy required to distort the reactants into the geometry that they obtain in the transition state. And for this reaction, you can imagine that, well, some double bonds are now becoming single bonds and some single bonds are becoming double bonds as well as you have parameterization of the terminal carbon atoms involved in the 
reaction. All of that is a, is a penalty, right? Because the geometry is now changing from its optimal state. Simultaneously, these distorted reactants are interacting in a very favorable manner. Okay, so uh, orbitals are overlapping and electrostatic interactions are, are happening and the interaction energy counters in part the strain energy. However, the strain energy is, is more destabilizing than the interaction is stabilizing. That's why you have a barrier in the first place. And oftentimes, it's useful to visualize um, these terms as a function of the reaction coordinate. So if you find your transition state, as identified by the dots, and you run an IRC calculation, you can obtain the actual curvature of the potential energy surface. And here you see two generic reactions. The black one is kinetically and thermodynamically preferred compared to the red reaction. Now one can wonder, why is that so? And we need a, a quantitative model to arrive at a causal model to predict why the black reaction is faster than the red reaction. And um, when you plot, when you perform your activation strain analysis at every single point along your intrinsic reaction coordinate, you obtain a plot like this. And in this uh, hypothetical situation, the strain curves are nearly superimposed so that they don't really play a role in determining why the black reaction is faster, right? The curves are, are, are nearly identical. Instead, the black reaction has a lower barrier because it benefits from a more stabilizing interaction energy along the entire reaction coordinate. And that has two effects. So starting with the red transition state. Uh, the black uh, transition state's lower, so the more favorable interaction energy pulls the transition state down and also for, uh, to an earlier point on the reaction coordinate. So the black transition state is slightly earlier. Okay, so here's, uh, this is the same equation we saw on the previous slide. And oftentimes, the interaction energy is important for determining reactivity. When that's the case, then we turn to the energy decomposition analysis. And this is a, a very useful tool for uh, decomposing the interaction energy into three physically meaningful terms that allow you to really dig into and explain using physical uh, concepts. They're very, very intuitive concepts. Uh, the electrostatic interaction um, is the interaction between uh, unperturbed charge densities on either of your reactants. So they can be favorable or unfavorable. The poly repulsion is this four electron uh, two center destabilizing effect that's proportional to the overlap squared of your interacting filled orbitals. And this is a destabilizing effect. And lastly, your orbital interactions, they encompass among other things, the classic donor acceptor homo lumo type uh, interactions. And they're proportional to the overlap squared divided by the energy gap between these uh, interacting orbitals. So this is the only difference between the polar repulsion and the orbital interactions. Okay, so now let's get into um, a, a, a really beautiful example of, of this model being used to understand classic chemistry. Okay, so this is work by Pascal van Meera in collaboration with Matthias Bickelhaupt and Israel Fernandez in Madrid. And so we were interested in how Lewis acids catalyze Diels Alder reactions. And in, and in this example, uh, counter to Jesus's chemistry, our Lewis acids are not frustrated. Um, so they're just uh, by themselves here. Okay, let's jump into it. So the uncatalyzed reaction between isoprene and methyl acrylate at room temperature takes about 70 days to reach complete conversion and gives a mixture of regioisomers. So you have 30% the 1,3 and 70% uh, the 1,4 regioisomer. Uh, if you add a Lewis acid like aluminum trichloride, the reaction uh, only takes uh, three hours at room temperature and now becomes nearly regioselective. Uh, so you only have 5% the 1,3 and 95% the 1,4. And we really want to understand um, 
Now, what is the origin of catalysis? How do these Lewis acids speed up this reaction uh, in such a profound manner? Well, we turn to uh, what is common knowledge? What is uh, the textbook explanation? Well, typically it's understood that uh, Lewis acids reduce the homoluma gap between, the, say, the homo of the diene and the in donation into the lumo of the dienophile. Okay, so upon coordination of a Lewis acid, it's, it, it is posited that the, uh, the Lewis acid stabilizes the lumo of this complex, and that allows for a more efficient charge transfer to occur. Okay, so if this is true, then we would expect to see uh, uh, the differences in reactivity to be traced back to the orbital interactions when we do our ETA on the upcoming slides. So keep that in mind. And um, yeah, so when setting out to study this origin of catalysis, we selected a variety of Lewis acids. Uh, we studied the uncatalyzed reaction just to have a, a nice starting point. Uh, and then to iodine, a weak Lewis acid, all the way to a, a very strong Lewis acid, like uh, aluminum trichloride. Okay. The first step is to study how the Lewis acid coordinates to the substrate. So we're really, we want to understand this, this bond, this Lewis acid, Lewis base uh, bond. So we turn to the energy decomposition analysis, and here you see the interaction energies, and they become more stabilizing as the Lewis acid becomes stronger. Okay, that makes sense. So they become more negative as the Lewis acid becomes stronger. And this nice, this agrees nicely with relative Lewis acidities that were determined experimentally using NMR. Okay, so we see the Lewis acids are getting stronger along this list. And this interaction energy is electrostatic in nature. So the electrostatic uh, energy becomes more stabilizing, more negative. And this is counteracted to a large degree by destabilizing poly repulsion. However, importantly, the, the, this, uh, this complex is bound because it also benefits from a significant degree of orbital interactions. So this bond is covalent in nature. There's charge transfer occurring between from the substrate to the Lewis acid. And this becomes also more stabilizing. And uh, we also look at the energy of the LUMO because this would be important, say, for the textbook explanation, right? So the stronger Lewis acid should induce a larger lowering, a larger stabilization of the LUMO. And um, uh, unfortunately, there, there doesn't seem to be a, a big, uh, there doesn't seem to be a systematic trend here. So already we were wondering what, what's going on. Okay, so now let's jump into the actual reaction. So just for clarity, we show the uncatalyzed reaction in black and then the reaction catalyzed by our strongest Lewis acid, aluminum trichloride. And here you see the energy, the electronic energy. And on the x-axis, we have uh, the distance between our newly forming carbon-carbon bonds. And here you have the transition states. And this is the actual curvature of the potential energy surface as obtained from an IRC calculation. OK, so we see the red reactions faster than the black reaction. And now we want to understand why. So uh, we plot the strain energy, and we see that the catalyzed reaction benefits from a slightly less destabilizing strain energy. So that's one of the reasons why uh, the catalyzed reaction is faster. And you can obtain some insight into why that is so by looking at the degree of asynchronicity of the transition states. So here you have the difference in the newly forming carbon-carbon bonds. And you see that the, the catalyzed reaction is more asynchronous than the uncatalyzed reaction. And that's, um, that higher degree of asynchronicity manifests in a less destabilizing strain energy because the newly forming uh, bonds are less, uh, they're less distorted. You have a, a lower degree of pyramidalization of these uh, carbon atoms. And for a deep dive into the origin of asynchronicity and deals all the reactions, I refer you to two recent works in chemical science and PCCP, uh, where we've uh, really laid out a, a very compelling uh, uh, origin story into asynchronicity. Next, we plot the interaction energy at all these points, and we see, well, this, this really is uh, the major component why the 
catalyze reactions faster because it benefits from a more stabilizing interaction energy along the entire reaction coordinate. Origin into the uh, insight into the origin of this is obtained by now plotting uh, the eta terms. So here we see the same exact data, just plotted on a different y-axis. So we see the red, uh, the catalyzed reaction is more stabilizing. And this interaction energy is more stabilizing. And why is that? So now we plot the orbital interactions and uh, surprisingly, around the transition state, these curves are nearly superimposed. So the orbital interactions don't really play a role in uh, the origin of Lewis acid uh, catalysis. And that was very, very profound and, and very surprising. Next, we plotted the electrostatic interactions. And here we see the opposite trend. So now the uncatalyzed reaction has a more stabilizing electrostatic. So this is counter to the trend in interaction. This doesn't play a role in, in the catalysis. And instead, very surprisingly, we found the profound role of polyrepulsion. So the less destabilizing polyrepulsion for the catalyzed reaction leads to a profound uh, rate enhancement. And, and, and so the polyrepulsion is really the, the source of, of, uh, of this mode of catalysis. Insight into the origin of the polyrepulsion is traced back to our cone sham MO analysis, where we looked at the overlap of all the filled orbitals between both of our uh, fragments, so the diene and, and the diene file. And we found, uh, we, we were able to trace it back to uh, this key four electron two center repulsion, whereby the overlap is much less for the catalyzed uh, case. And uh, we trace it back to this. So here we see the, the structures, the schematic, uh, the fragment molecular orbitals. And I want to uh, orient you to the uh, amplitude on the alpha and beta carbons that are involved in the newly forming bond. So these are the alpha and beta carbons of our dienophile, these carbons here. And you see that the molecular orbital is, is large in the case of the uncatalyzed reaction. And upon coordination of our Lewis acid, we see a profound reduction in the size of this orbital. And this is, this is why you have a much less orbital overlap in the case of the catalyzed reaction. So you have significant charge transfer from your dienophile to the Lewis acid. The Lewis acid just pulls electron density out of the substrate and reduces the repulsion between the uh, dienophile and the diene. So this is really cool. Next, uh, we wanted to understand why the orbital interactions aren't decisive, right? So that's the next step of this puzzle. So we looked at the uh, both the normal electron demand and the inverse electron demand interactions. And the normal demand occurs between the HOMO, the diene, and the LUMO, the dienophile. And just as we would uh, just as we would expect, the homo lumo gap is smaller for the Lewis acid catalyzed reaction. Okay, so that that makes sense. Um, and interestingly, the orbital overlap also becomes slightly worse. So this offsets each other. And I want to encourage everyone to uh, study both the normal and inverse electron demand because they're both important. Um, and here we see that the catalyzed reaction has a much larger uh, uh, inverse electron demand gap and also a much worse orbital overlap. So the gain in normal demand is completely offset by the loss in inverse electron demand interactions. And they cancel, and that's why the orbital interactions are nearly the same for uh, the uncatalyzed and catalyzed reaction. Okay, so this slide summarizes about four years of work and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears of our uh, PhD students. And we've now been able to show the general uh, phenomena of uh, polylower catalysis in a variety of uh, organic reactions, ranging from Michael addition reactions to aromatic diels alder reactions to epoxide ring openings to aza diels alder reactions, as well as mean reactions here. So it's a, this is a very general concept in organic chemistry. And the take-home message for today 
is that Lewis acid catalysis goes via the novel polymorphic catalysis mechanism, and it's not caused by an effective enhancement of the Lewis acidity of the dienophile, but instead is due to polarization of the pi system away from the reacting center. And in the case of the dienophile, it's the carbon-carbon double bond. And this has a few effects. Well, first it reduces the polyrepulsion with the diene. That leads to an overall stabilization of the interaction between the diene and the dienophile. And in turn, that leads to the lower activation barrier and thus the enhanced reactivity. So I wanna encourage you that if you're interested in applying these uh, methods to study your reactions, um, they can be used to study any reaction. Um, we've published step-by-step -step really cookbook instructions in Nature Protocols. Uh, we have a new review published in ChemCom. And all this analysis was performed using PyFrag. This is an open source software published in JCC. And our activation strain analysis is compatible with ADF, Gaussian, Orca, and TurboMole. And the EDA is compatible with ADF. So you can do this yourself. Reach out if you need help. Uh, and, and of course, read these, uh, read the instructions here. This work was also done by Pascal. And lastly, I need to thank the group. Um, so we have a, a very, very nice group, um, about 30, 30 people at any given time. And it's led by Matias, uh, Celia Fonseca Guerra, and myself. And now I look at these photos and it, it, it makes me realize we need to take a new one because both these were taken uh, before the COVID pandemic. Uh, so I think it's time to update this. And I would also like to thank funding from NWO and support from TFU. And uh, all the calculations were performed using uh, ADF, which is developed by SCM. And they were run on Surfsera, uh, on the Surfsera cluster. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions now. Thank you, Trevor, for your uh, very interesting and also didactic um, talk um, to to teach us a little bit about the activation strain model. And obviously, you mentioned that um, you just gave one example of one reaction, uh, but you also studied organic and biochemical reactions. Um, uh, for I guess for fundamental understanding of uh, what what is going on, uh, I'm waiting to see if any questions come from the audience. Feel, please feel free to use the question function. Um, we are actually right on time, um, but in the meantime, so we have a couple of minutes. Can you just mention briefly the other types of reactions that you start, like or specific reactions that you that you are studying? Uh, to give an idea to our audience of what what they can do and yeah, thanks for so, sharing that i think it's uh, it's very cool that anyone could do this if if, if they wanted to <laughs> yeah yeah that's the idea so so these computational tools can be studied uh can be used to study any uni molecular and biomolecular or even higher order uh, reactions um and yeah this slide shows that we were uh were studying organic reactions, so fundamental uh, organic reactions. We have also used the methodology to study um, uh, the oxidative addition of uh, palladium and iron catalysts into a variety of uh, uh, bonds. And um, I mentioned that we've also studied the key step in DNA replication. So that involves, say, a nucleophilic attack um on a phosphorus atom so sn2 at phosphorus and we've we've studied that and uh, been able to pinpoint the uh, the critical role of uh, magnesium in the active site of dna polymerase uh, we we all know there are two magnesiums there and uh, using our analysis we were able to to figure out why magnesium catalyzes that key uh, step in the backbone elongation of dna um, so uh, very versatile method, and I just wanted to highlight that. And uh, yeah, you can reach out uh, and uh, yeah. We, we do have one question uh, from the audience from 
Jean-François Niedengarten, and he's asking you, are B3 LYP calculations okay for, for the SAM analysis, for SAM analysis? Um, well, we didn't use B3 LIP in, in this work. Um, and I would say, if you want to use that, you may consider, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, adding dispersion corrections um, because B3 lip lacks that. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it really depends on the on the reaction that you're interested in studying. B3 lip is okay for certain reactions, and you you want to do your homework and figure out which which is the the best uh, computational method to use. Okay, we have one more question from uh, Jung Tao Ye. Um, he says, very informative talk. Thank you, Trevor. I'm wondering how general do you think it, this important, um, this uh, 4E orbital lowering versus 2E orbital lowering effect, or how important uh, this is? I guess that's his question. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important question that we are also asking ourselves. So we are wondering where is the limit of this uh, new poly lowering catalysis mechanism. Um, right now, we're, we are uh, convinced that this is operative in a variety of uh, Lewis acid catalyzed organic reactions. We're also seeing that it's operative. Um, other researchers in, in China are showing that it's operative in uh, 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 metal catalysis reactions. Um, so we're really wondering where is the limit. Uh, and, and this really requires uh, a systematic study of, of other fundamental uh, reactions uh, to see how general this really is. And we, were, we recently published uh, an account in chemical research on, on the generality of this method. So I, I encourage you also to check that out. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, this just tells you that uh, fundam fundamental research is never out of fashion pretty much. We, we I, I hope not. I hope yeah. not. Yeah. Me yeah. too. Great. Um, so with that, I'm going to close the Q&A for Trevor Stuck. And Trevor, if you can either stop uh, sharing or maybe you'll, um, maybe uh, now Rebecca will get the presenter rights. So while Rebecca uh, prepares uh, her presentation, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Uh, Rebecca Mellon studied uh, her undergraduate and PhD at the University of Cambridge, completing her PhD in 2012 with Professor Dominic Wright. And after that, she continued with her postdoctoral studies with Professor uh, Douglas Stephan. Uh, we heard that name when Jesus was giving his introduction in, in Toronto. And then with Professor Lutz Gade in Heidelberg. Um, then she took up a position at Cardiff University, where she's uh, currently uh, in 2014, and she's now a professor in inorganic chemistry. In 2018, she was awarded with an, um, I think this is Engineering and Physical Science Research Council Early Career Fellowship, and then she was the recipient of a 2019 R.C. Harrison Mildola Memorial Prize. Her research interests lie in main group chemistry and the applications of main group Lewis acids in synthesis and catalysis. So you can see a trend here <laughs> with the talks today. Um, and the, the name of her talk, you can already see, Lewis acidic borings as catalysts for carbon transfer reactions. So now, Rebecca, I give the floor to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for um, organizing this symposium. Um, so today I will continue the theme um, on Lewis acid uh, um, reactions. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is um, the use of Lewis acidic boranes as catalysts for carbene transfer reactions. Um, and the types of boranes um, that we are using um, have also been used um, in, for example, frustrated Lewis pair chemistry um, and also in Lewis acid um, catalyzed reactions, such as um, the Diels Older reaction we saw um, in the previous talk. So we are interested um, in a highly Lewis acidic uh, triaryl boranes, um, where we have electron withdrawing uh, groups attached. These are typically fluorine uh, atoms, but we also um, have looked at chlorinated uh, derivatives too. Um, the most common borane um, that's used is the pentafluorophenyl borane, um, and this is commercially available. However, it is very expensive. 
So I think at Sigma Roldrich, if you look um, online, it's 250 euros uh, for one gram. So we make this ourselves in the lab and these are very um, easy to make. Um, and we either use uh, the Grignard route, uh, which is shown above, or the organolithiation uh, route. We tend to use the Grignard route um, because um, there's a potential problem when you're doing these reactions, uh, in particular on large scale with the um, organolithium intermediate, that potentially um, if you heat the reaction mixture up above my minus 40 degrees, you could generate um, explosive benzyme intermediates. So we tend to use the Grignard route. We then react this with uh, boron trifluoride, and then we generate a crude brown solid, which we sublime uh, to give our borings. And so we have made a range of different uh, borings within our laboratory. Some of these um, are previously known. Um, and what we're interested in with these compounds is using them um, in synthetic chemistry and also in catalysis. And as we saw um, in Trevor's talk, the Lewis acidity of these compounds is very um, important. And so we've been looking at the Lewis acidity of these uh, various compounds by different uh, methods. So you can either use computational based methods um, or experimental methods. And one method that we commonly used um, is known as the Gutman Beckett method. And this is an NMR based method where you add a probe to your Lewis acid. And then when you add this, in this case, it's triethyl phosphine oxide. When you coordinate this to your Lewis acid in question, you will remove electron density from that phosphorus atom and you will see this in the phosphorus NMR spectrum. So when we look at the Lewis acidity of the borings that we have in that group, what we find is they increase in Lewis acidity in this order. I should say, however, that these are the results from this NMR based method. And actually, if we look at computational uh, methods, the order is uh, changed slightly. But generally, as you increase the number of uh, fluorine atoms, you see an increase in Lewis acidity. So what I want to talk to you um, about today is the work that we've been doing um, using these boron Lewis acids to activate diazo compounds. Um, and first of all, I'd like to start with thanking the people who have done the work. Um, so this work was started um, by a PhD student in my group, um, Darren Old, who is now a postdoc um, in Cambridge, um, and joined with um, a PhD student in Thomas Firth's group uh, at Cardiff. And currently this is being undertaken by um, PhD student Kate Stefkova um, and my postdoc, uh, Ian Vescott. And I'd like to thank the various other people who have been working on the project, um, either in, for synthetic applications or also in, in computational studies. So activation of diazo compounds um, is well known using uh, transition metals. Typically, you would do this, uh, for example, with metals such as rhodium, where you activate uh, your diazo compound, you release uh, nitrogen to give you your metal carbenoid intermediate. And then you could use this in a range of different uh, synthetic uh, reactions, um, such as cyclopropanation or CH activation. But it was only really recently that people started to look at um, using these boring Lewis acids to activate uh, nitrogen containing compounds. And so a few examples are shown here using uh, trispentafluorophenyl borane, where it's been used to activate uh, metal dinitrogen complexes um, towards um, protonation or silylation. Um, and this example here, where um, the borings is used to activate the diazo compound towards release of dinitrogen. Just another example um, using borings uh, to activate uh, nitrogen compounds um, was shown in uh, 2018 in this work by Holger Braunschweig's group that showed that you can take a boron one compound and activate dinitrogen um, in the absence of a transition metal. So we started this work um, in 2019, and the first studies that we looked at were stoichiometric reactions of boranes uh, with diazo esters. And what we found is that when you react a borane with a diazo ester, the first thing that happens is you coordinate your boron Lewis acid to the ester oxygen atom. And this will come uh, important when we start looking at the mechanism later. Um, this is the mode of um, activation of the diazo compound. If, however, you uh, leave this reaction at room temperature, you rapidly get um, elimination of dinitrogen, and in the stoichiometric reaction, you transfer an aryl group from boron to the carbon atom. And so you generate these uh, boron enolates. And this was also shown previously um, from Doug Stefan back in 2012. But what we found with these reactions is that the number of aryl groups that you transfer from the borane 
to the diazo ester depends upon the Lewis acidity of the borane. So if we just use um, the least Lewis acidic borane, uh, triphenyl borane, what we find is we just transfer one aryl group from boron to uh, the diazo compound to generate this uh, boron enolate here. If we increase the Lewis acidity slightly to the, um, the four fluoro species or the two four uh, fluoro borane, then we can transfer more aryl groups uh, from the borane to the diazo ester. So this compound here will be able to react with a second equivalent of the diazo ester to generate uh, this intermediate here where we have the boron bound to two uh, enolates. And then finally, if you move to the most Lewis acidic borines, you can transfer all three aryl groups. So with the three, uh, four, five fluorinated aryl borane and the pentafluorophenyl borane, then we can transfer all three aryl groups to give us um, this uh, compound here. And this was very interesting because in these reactions, it means that we can just uh, use a third of an equivalent of the borane for these aryl transfer reactions. So we then wondered what can we do um, with these boron enolates? So the first thing we did was just to hydrolyze the boron enolate to give us the ester product where we've just had aryl transfer from the borane uh, to the diazo compound. And as you can see, this works very well. Uh, we had a wide um, scope of reactions with different diazo compounds and different uh, boranes generally in very uh, good yields. And the reason why these yields are a bit lower um, is because in this case, we did this um, using a third of an equivalent uh, of the borane. So this was nice. Um, we also looked at um, applying this reaction uh, towards the synthesis um, of this compound here, which is an antidepressant. And in order to make this compound, you go via this uh, intermediate here. And previously, this intermediate has been made um, using a rhodium catalyzed reaction. And so what we did was we synthesized um, this 3,4 chlorinated borane, which I showed earlier. This has a very um, high Lewis acidity. And when we react this with the diazo compound, we can get this intermediate in very good um, yields after quite short uh, reaction times. And so this was very nice. Um, however, when we were exploring the scope further, what we found is that we saw very interesting reactivity when we were using um, diazo esters with this ortho uh, benzyl uh, functional group. And instead of just getting the aryl transfer, what we um, isolated and crystallized out from the reaction was these uh, benzofuranone compounds where we've generated this quite sterically uh, hindered quaternary carbon center. And these are quite challenging to make, um, but as we can see from the um, selected examples um, on the right-hand side, these um, benzofuranones with quaternary carbon centers are very important um, in natural products. So we were wondering how does this uh, reaction take place? And what we did was we followed this reaction um, over time um, and isolated the different products formed in the reaction at um, different time points. So what we did was we um, took our diazo starting material and reacted it with borane. And the first intermediate that we see is the boron enolate, um, which we saw previously. And if we hydrolyze the reaction after just five minutes, then we generate the um, first product um, in the reaction, which is the aryl transfer product. And so we can see this after five minutes, um, we generate 33% uh, of this aryl uh, transfer product. If we then need this reaction a bit longer, um, so five, um, 10 to 20 minutes, what happens is we get an intramolecular attack of this boron enolate onto the uh, benzyl group. And so now we would generate a quaternary carbon center. So if we hydrolyze this intermediate here, we would generate this uh, alcohol product. And as you can see, if you hydrolyze this, uh, between five and 20 minutes, then we get an increasing percentage of uh, the alcohol product. If we then leave this um, reaction for even longer, so 60 minutes or, or uh, more, then what happens is we get cyclization from attack of the oxygen um, onto the uh, ester to give us um, the final product. And we start to see this being formed after about one hour reaction time. We also did some crossover experiments to see if this um, attack of the boron enolate uh, onto the benzyl group was intramolecular um, or intermolecular. Um, so what we did was we took two different um, starting materials and reacted this with um, the 345 fluorinated aryl borane. And what we see in the, this is the crude uh, 
fluorine NMR spectrum, what we see is we only see uh, two products formed from the reaction. So we see these two uh, products here. And we don't see any of um, this product here, which would be the crossover uh, product. So what this tells us is this is going via an intramolecular process. So this was um, a very nice initial study um, where we showed that depending on the time point that you quench the reaction, you can get different uh, products from the reaction. However, um, what we were interested in is, could we do these uh, reactions catalytically? So could, rather than using the borane as a reagent, could we use it as a catalyst? And before we started this work, there was uh, one publication out in 2016, um, and a couple of other papers came out um, during the time that we were doing this work that looked at using um, the tris-pentafluorophenol borane as a catalyst for CH insertion reactions, carbon-carbon um, bond forming reactions, and also nucleophilic substitution. And this area has really taken off in the last um, three years, I guess. Um, and we recently published um, a review on the uh, different reactions that have been done, um, looking at using borates as a catalyst for um, these carbon transfer reactions. So I just want to talk about one of the examples that we've been looking at today. Um, and this is in reactions with uh, various cyclic um, and heterocyclic compounds. And so we were interested um, in reactions of the diazo uh, ester starting materials with um, pyrroles and uh, indoles. And what we find in these reactions is we can use uh, 10 mole percent loading of the borane catalyst um, in quite mild conditions, and we get um, exclusively the CH uh, functionalization products. So in the case of the indoles, we get C3 um, insertion, and in the case of the pyrroles, we get C2 insertion. And we have quite a good um, scope for these reactions, um, but perhaps what's uh, particularly interesting in these cases is that we can use unprotected systems. So here we can use unprotected indoles and we don't see any um, NH insertion. And this is a common problem if you're looking at the transition metal catalyzed reactions where typically you would have to protect the nitrogen um, first. But in this case, we see no um, NH insertion. We also looked at other um, cyclic and heterocyclic compounds, um, including uh, indines and benzofurans. And what we find in this case is rather than seeing um, CH insertion, we see uh, cyclopropanation. And a similar um, examples were published um, about the same time by Wilkerson Hill, who looked at the cyclopropanation um, of alkenes. And in this case, we get very um, diastereoselective reactions, which we found computationally was due to the large sterically uh, demanding uh, nature of our boring catalyst. So we were interested in understanding the mechanisms uh, for these reactions and also um, to explain the different selectivity between um, CH insertion or cyclopropanation. And so we undertook some uh, computational studies to look at activation of the diazo compound and then subsequent uh, reactions with the indoles or the furans. Um, and this has also recently been um, explored in more detail computationally and we've published this um, just a few months ago um, in uh, Chemio J. So what we find uh, when we look at these reactions is that um, in the first instance, the borane activates the uh, ester oxygen, oxygen atom. We looked at both activating um, the oxygen atom and the nitrogen atom, uh, which was previously uh, suggested in substrates which do not possess the ester. And what we find is that it's uh, more preferable for the borane to coordinate uh, to the oxygen atom. Upon coordination uh, to the ester, what we find is we see a lengthening of this uh, carbon-nitrogen bond and also a shortening of this carbon-carbon bond. This then promotes release of dinitrogen to give us our uh, carbene, which is stabilized by our boron-Lewis acid. And then it's this intermediate that reacts with um, the indole, the furan, um, or uh, the pyrrol. And uh, what we find um, is that um, essentially whether we get CH insertion or cyclopropanation depends upon um, whether you're forming the kinetic product or the thermodynamic product. And in all cases, the uh, cyclopropanation product is the kinetic product and the CH insertion product is the thermodynamic product. 
And so when we're looking at indoles or pyrroles, and the activation barrier to go from the cyclopropanated product to the CH insertion product is relatively low, which is why we just see uh, CH insertion. However, if we move to the furan or indine substrates, the reaction to go from our cyclopropanated product, which forms first, to the CH insertion product is too high, which is why we just see um, cyclopropanation in these cases. So that brings me uh, to the end of my um, talk. So just to give you a brief introduction of the work that we've been doing um, using boron Lewis acids uh, to activate diazo compounds for um, either CH insertion or um, cyclopropanation. And so finally, I'd like to thank the, again the people who have uh, done the work. I'd like to thank my collaborators at the University of Tasmania for their work with the computational studies. Um, and in particular, I'd like to thank um, Universities Wales for funding uh, the collaboration um, with the University of Tasmania and also the EPSRC uh, for funding the research. And thank you uh, for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rebecca, for your talk. Um, we don't have any questions coming in yet. Um, I don't know if I missed it while you were uh, describing your, your examples for using uh, these uh, borings as catalysts, but how do you have, uh, did you do any comparisons? How do they compare to uh, other catalysts used for the same reaction in terms of uh, uh, scope and, and selectivity? Um, so we looked at, generally with the reactions, we try other, I guess, common Lewis acids, main group Lewis acids. So we'll always compare with things like boron trifluoride, boron trichloride, um, and Bronsted acids. Um, if we compare to the transition metals, then um, in the study I showed um, in the last example, it depends on the transition metal systems, a lot, lot have been used. Um, but sometimes we see um, better selectivity in terms of, um, there seems to be a better selectivity between whether we get cyclopropanation or CH insertion. Um, but again, there, there are so many metal systems that do it that, <laughs> yeah, we can find examples of yeah, better and worse examples. Yeah, always. Okay, uh, we have one question from Tiao Gan Ong. Uh, he's uh, from Taiwan. He's asking, or she, I'm sorry <laughs> if I got that wrong. Is it possible for um, is it possible for aluminum uh, phenyl, I guess, Al uh, PH3 <laughs> to mm -hmm. RL transfer with carbene precursor? So we haven't tried aluminium, but that's something that we're we're starting to work on now. Um, so we, we, we've recently published a paper on making similar derivatives based on aluminium. And so we're looking at, um, I guess, making a better synthetic route to these aluminium compounds and then also trying these in similar reactions to what we use the borings for. So this would be, yeah, our next next study, hopefully. OK. Uh, I, not a question, just a comment uh, from Sharon Napam Nembena. Excellent talk, <laughs> Professor Rebecca Mellon. So, OK, since we are now a, a little bit tight with the time, I'm going to stop the Q&A. But if anyone else, ha uh, anyone else has a question, they can still post it there. And then I will pass it on to Rebecca through the chat. And now we are, OK, Monica is already there. Um, while she shares her screen, then I'll give a brief introduction about Monica. Uh, Monica Perez Temprano obtained her PhD in 2011 at the University of Valladolid in Spain under the supervi uh, supervision of Professor Pablo Espinet and Professor Juan Casares. In 2012, she joined the research group of Professor Melanie Sanford at the University of Michigan in the US. And then in 2015, she began her independent career as a junior group leader at the Institute of Chemical Research of Catalonia. Um, at ISIC, this institute, uh, her group is focused on using mechanisms as a priority tool for the developing innovative and more sustainable first row metal catalyzed transformations. And her research career has been recognized through numerous awards and honors, including the Junior Scientist Participation Fellowship of uh, the Bürgerstock Conference in 2018. And uh, she was selected as one of the talented 12 of 2018 by Chemical Engineering News and the 2020 Young Investigation uh, Investigator Group Leader Award by the Spanish Royal Society of Chemistry. 
Her talk today, which you can already see, is uh, the cipher mechanisms of to design better catalytic reactions. So I don't think she has any <laughs> examples from Lewis reactions to show us, but it's definitely, an interesting, uh, def definitely an interesting topic um, also uh, within the realm of catalysis. So the floor is yours. I'm just going to hide myself. So thanks, Rosalva, for the really nice introduction. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the the, uh, the chemistry team for, for putting together this very, very nice uh, event. And also, I would like to con congratulate uh, Rebecca, Trevor, and, and Jesus, because uh, the talk has been really, really inspiring. I'm learning today a lot. So I would like to start my presentation with a very provocative uh, statement. And oh, yes. So um, I think that. Uh, most people in the audience that just work in the lab could agree with me that most of the reaction that we set up in academic lab fail. And when I say this is because most of our reactions are not efficient when we start developing a new transformation because sometimes the starting material is not consumed or we observe by products. Uh, sometimes uh, the starting material is consumed but we don't see product formation that for me this is a very interesting uh, case from a mechanistic point of view. But I would like to stop in this reaction when we observe low yields or the reaction just perform, like uh, works in under harsh conditions. Normally, this fourth uh, category uh, is the starting point for optimization process. And when we have uh, when we have optimized our reaction conditions, normally we publish our results and just the efficient processes uh, become part of the literature and the community chemistry knowledge. And that is a huge problem for me because we are discarding pretty much most of the work that we run in the, in the lab. But not only that, uh, even robust methodologies fail when, when they are tried in real world assay. For example, in a very, very nice paper from uh, Merck in 2015, they disclosed that when they went, when they went through their uh, electronic lab notebooks, they discovered that more than 50% of the carbon nitrogen bond forming reaction that they perform in late stage functionalization, they didn't lead to the desired product. But not only that, um, next, uh, in 2016, Nature published a survey when they contact uh, researchers from different fields and, and chemists recognize more than 80% of the chemists that fill the survey recognize that they failed to replicate another research work. Researcher work, sorry. So, this is uh, a little bit frightening if you think carefully about this situation. So when I started my independent career, I started wondering myself, why do a reaction fail and how we can capitalize on those failed reactions to streamline uh, process design? And my group came up with a really simple concept that is that hmm, the success of failure of any chemical transformation relies on the performance of reaction intermediate involved in the elementary step of a catalytic cycle. This can seem very obvious, but normally is overlooked, and this can be a completely game changer for not efficient transformation. So what, as my title said, and, and also uh, as Rosalba mentioned, my group wants to use mechanistic studies as a priority tool for reaction design, and what we do is to trap reaction intermediate and we use them as we call them knowledge building block for overcoming limitation and exploring innovative activities. And what we do is uh, to what we want to do is to shift gear toward mechanism driven design, connecting catalysis and process design through mechanism. And we have um, kind of uh, this is our way of thinking or our methodology. So what we do is to identify a problem, normally using our knowledge building block approach. Next, we propose solution test the solution and what we want to do is improve efficiency and hopefully create new reactivity. So basically what we do is to use lean management, management tools for chemical uh, design. And we are um, applying our methodology or our way of thinking to CT star cobalt catalyze directed seed functionalization reaction because as you will see this is a very exciting topic but also very challenging if you want to, uh, to, to develop a mechanism-driven approach. So CP star cobalt uh, 3 catalyst uh, has emerged as a really powerful tool in directed seed functionalization reaction, 
not only because they can be a cost-effective alternative to reduce catalyst, but also because they can exhibit a unique reactivity due to its electronegativity, hard uh, nature, and its small radius. And here uh, I'm showing you some of the main players of the of the field: Ruth Ackerman, Sugub Chan, uh, Jonathan Evan, uh, Frank Glorious. Uh, I would like to especially mention Kanae Matsunaga because they were the, the first one in 2013 that published the first catalytic paper in, in this field. And, and as you can see, uh, the vast majority of the transformation involved electrophilic couplings. Uh, so this is uh, from a synthetic point of view. Uh, they have been uh, fantastic uh, synthetic methodologies developed over the past few years. However, from a mechanistic perspective, this system ha uh, in 2000, back in 2016, were pretty challenging because the reversible nature of the seed activation uh, uh, really hampered the, the synthesis and isolation of key metallocycles, so limiting the understanding of this transformation. And also, when a reaction didn't work, it was really hard to detect what, uh, where the bottleneck was. So uh, this was our um, starting point for our uh, research line. And I'm going to just show you uh, the main highlights of our, in a, of our contribution into this field. So how first uh, set the basis of our research program. And the first challenge was how we can access these elusive intermediates. And we were targeting in particular the cationic cobalt cycle that uh, are formed after the CH activation. And since the seed methylation was a challenge, we came up with an alternative and we decided to explore one of the most uh, important reactions in organometallic chemistry, oxidative addition. And in this case, the completely game changer was the use of acetonitrile as a stabilizing ligand. So that allowed us to not only access, but also fully uh, isolate in really high yields, this cationic cobalt cycle that was completely uh, analogous to the cationic intermediate proposed after the CH activation. Um, this cationic cobalt cycle, uh, gave us multiple surprises. One of them was that when we use it as the catalyst in the, this uh, anulated reaction, this, uh, this cobalt compound performs better than uh, the wavely used CP star cobalt catalyst that I show you here in the, in the slide. We can uh, reduce the catalyst loading to just one mole percent. That is one of the lowest in, in CP star cobalt catalysis. And also, the use of this cobalt cycle uh, established by citronitrile allow us to observe under the stoichiometric and catalytic uh, condition uh, a resting state that turned to be this seven-member ring cobalt cycle that is formed after the uh, um, alkene, co alkene coordination and magnetic insertion into this carbon cobalt bone. And this was the first unambiguously characterized reactive cobalt cycle in, in, in cobalt catalysis in this type of transformation at that time. Uh, and that we were able not only to observe by, by X-ray, but also fully uh, follow it by, by NMR. So this was our, our first contribution. And um, after that, um, resembling uh, all the information that we got in this project, we uh, move on to our next chapter and covering unexpected additive effects in this type of transformation. So this project started uh, because uh, since the beginning of this, of this uh, research line, I've been very obsessed with the reversibility of the CH methylation. And basically, if you think carefully about this, this is a very simple concept. So this is uh, the reversible nature that is telling us that is equilibrium that is shifted toward the starting material. So we wonder if we can apply to all the knowledge that we acquired in our previous program in our previous work and use acetonitrile to make this CH1 cleavage irreversible. And um, we were really happy because we found that not only that acetonitrile can promote this irreversibility, but also that uh, the addition of HFIP, this perfluorinated alcohol, is key for accelerating the CH methylation step. Yes, in the absence of, of HFIP and using this pyridine as base in this reaction, uh, the reaction uh, gets full completion after 20 hours. When we added one equivalent of HFIP, the reaction was speed up 10 times. But indeed, in the presence of 50 equivalents, the reaction is done in, the, in less than five minutes. 
this extraordinary effect uh, make us wondering if we could uh, observe something similar under catalytic conditions. And we, using this uh, empirimidylin doll as, as initial suspect, um, we wonder if uh, using uh, alkynes as coupling partner, in particular this diphenyl acetylene, uh, we could observe uh, a positive or negative effect of HFIP in these two transformations, uh, because in principle, we could observe uh, opposite uh, um, effects depending of, of uh, its case. So we started uh, exploring, and I wanted to highlight that both the transformations were uh, previously reported by Liam Sundunarayu, respectively. So we started in the oxidative annulation, and with here I show you the reaction conditions reported by Liam co-workers, and if you, you can observe here that the, the, the were kind of harsh reaction condition, high temperature, long reaction time, and the yield was, uh, was good. But uh, in our case, using our uh, cationic cobalt cycle as precatalyst and adding just FHFIP to the reaction mixture, we could reduce the temperature from 135 to 60 degrees, reduce the reaction time from 24 hours to 8, and just increase the, the yield at up to 91% uh, yield. Uh, here, what we, after just a um, long story short, the polarity of HFIP is crucial for promoting this transformation because it helps to solvelize the salts that uh, um, uh, we use in, in the reaction media. And uh, when we move to the uh, hydroregulation process, what we observe is also a extremely beneficial effect. In this case, we also uh, use our catenic cycle as precatalyst, and instead of pivalic acid, uh, of we use pivalic acid as additive. But again, the presence of HFIP uh, favors the reaction. Uh, we can perform the reaction at room temperature. After six hours, we got uh, almost quantitative uh, yield in, uh, of, of this transformation. In this case, the, sol uh, the polar uh, nature of the solvent was not key. The key was that uh, the, the, the acidity of the proton source that contribute in this protodemetallation. So this, this, this work uh, taught us that we can use our knowledge building block as a really powerful tool to improve efficiency. And also that there are a lot of, uh, um, still now, a lot of uh, information that we don't know about the role of additive in, in catalysis. And it's, it's something that we are really trying to explore in different type of transformation that we are working now. So, so far, um, uh, our first work was based on, on using pyridine as directing group, the second one, pyrimidine. So both are considered a strong directing group. So uh, we wanted to challenge us a little bit and we wanted to move to more real world uh, system. And when I think about that in this type of transformation, also from an organometallic point of view, what came to my mind was uh, the use of prevalent functional groups that are considered weakly directing groups as at amide, ketones, ester, um, aldehydes. And uh, I would like to highlight that even using noble methyl, the access to uh, metal acyclic intermediate established by these uh, directing groups is very challenging. Um, and considering uh, uh, first of methyls, there are not so many examples. So we we challenge ourselves, as I mentioned, uh, thinking if we can access this type of knowledge building block using this type of directing groups, and we, we did, uh, not using CH activation. Unfortunately, we have not been able to isolate this intermediate through that uh, synthetic route. But when we apply our oxidation state uh, pathway, uh, we were really glad to see uh, that this transformation works very, very nicely at room temperature and just after five minutes, 50 minutes, we observe really high, uh, high uh, yields. Uh, here we have our, we call it our knowledge building block scope. We have aldehydes, ketone, amide, esters, five member ring cobalt cycle, six member ring cobalt cycles. All of them have been uh, characterized by NMR and, and X-ray crystallography. And we have, uh, in, this, in this world, we investigated uh, different things, but I would like to highlight that one of the main uh, accomplishments that we, we did is that we can use this cobalt cycle as precatalyst in different CH functionalization reaction, and the yield that we obtained for all of them are completely co comparable to the previous reports uh, in the literature. 
So we really think that this can be an uh, interesting um, approach for es expanding the type of catalyst that can be used in CP star cobalt catalyzed fusionization reactions. And I would like to finish my presentation with our more recent work. Uh, and so far, I show you that uh, CH functionalized uh, cobalt catalyzed CH functionalization reaction using this type of complexes has been a very interesting field over the past few years, especially because these catalysts are particularly good coupling electrophiles as, as, as partners. However, if you check here, the, the ratio of, or of, the, of the number of uh, nucleophilic coupling using this, this system is really limited. Indeed, as if I'm not uh, wrong, in the literature you can only find three reports, uh, one focus in CH methylation by Lutz Ackerman and two focus in carbon sulfur conforming reaction by Glorious and Anwan. So this was particularly shocking to us considering how important uh, transition metal catalysis has been in, in coupling a nucleophilic nucleophiles in carbon carbon bond forming reaction or carbon nitrogen or carbon ethyl bond forming reaction. So we wonder what if there was a problem or a fundamental problem associated to the, the limited number of examples. So we selected as benchmark, benchmark system the trephromethylation reported by one of our workers because. I don't have time to talk about that, but we in the group, we are very interested uh, in, in, in investigating uh, silver nucleophiles as, the methylate, as transmetallating agents in transition metal catalysis. Uh, and also because uh, the nucleophilic coupling partner was commercially available and it contains fluorine that is very, very useful for performing mechanistic study by fluorine NMR. So the first thing that we did is to check the the catalytic cycle and just target what we consider the most interesting knowledge building block that we could uh, we could do this um, this cobalt cycle where that contains a cobalt sulfur bond and through a transmetallation step we were at, we have access to this cobalt cycle in really high yields and the first thing that we did is to to test uh, its participation in in a relative elimination is, step, just heating under similar reaction condition to the ones proposed in catalysis. And the first surprise was that we didn't observe any product formation. So uh, we wonder uh, what, uh, what was going on and we decided to investigate the relative elimination step, but in the presence of the nucleophile that it was using catalysis, this silver nucleophile. And we were really glad to see that just under similar reaction conditions, we observe almost quantitative formation after one hour uh, of the desired uh, copper partner. So with this information in hand, uh, we, we propose that an oxidative induced relative elimination step was responsible of the formation of a carbon sulfur bond. And this is in alignment with some uh, works, uh, related works uh, on rhodium and iridium published by, by Chan and Blakely over the past few years. Um, by DFT, we have, sorry, by electrochemical analysis, we have uh, confirmed that the access to cobalt for uh, species is very facile. And by DFT calculation, we have also con uh, confirmed in collaboration with Professor Felipe Macera uh, that the relative elimination from cobalt 4 is very, very facile, in, in, in sharp contrast to the one from cobalt 3, that the relative like, the energy barrier it was almost 30 kcals per mole. And indeed, we have explored the employment of other potential uh, chemical oxidants. And what we have found is that manganese 3 is, is very nice for this system. And we have also performed bulk electrolysis. And that also uh, works very nicely to, to perform this, this type of transformation. So basically, this our last work has shown uh, for the first time the experimentally and computationally evidences for uh, the involvement of uh, oxidative induced relative elimination in cobalt, in cobalt uh, systems and also opens very interesting menu, venues for the potential uh, exploitation of high valent cobalt species in catalysis. So basically, uh, this has, has I show you what we have done so far. And right now, I don't have time uh, to show you what we are doing, but basically, 
uh, uh, we can tell you that we are moving towards methodology and developing new uh, synthetic protocols, taking advantage of all the knowledge that we have acquired over the past five, six years uh, on this cobalt-based system and all these knowledge building blocks that we have um, obtained. Uh, I was counting, I think that we have published around 10, 15 structure, but I can tell you that we have more than 70. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of information that right now we are trying to, to, to use for developing uh, innovative chemical transformations. And now I would like to show you the most important slide. It has been the people that has a shared math pathway over the past uh, five, six years. I show you in the slides the, the main players on the different works, and I would like to especially highlight the current members of my group. I show you the work that Sarah has been done on high valent cobalt chemistry, and uh, I'm very excited that I hope that very soon I'm going to show uh, the work that the rest of the, the team, the team is very, very new, pretty much everyone has joined over the past six months. So um, they have done a terrific work uh, moving the group towards synthetic approaches uh, and uh, they, are, they are going to do fantastic uh, work in the next years. I would also uh, thanks um, the collaborations that uh, we have established over the past few years. We have recently new ones that are more related to the synthetic work that we are doing. Of course, uh, the funding, again, the chemistry team for for the putting together this event, all of you for your kind attention, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, yeah, this this was uh, a lot of information, but definitely a very Sorry. interesting approach. No, that that's I mean it's great. Um, I didn't mention it uh, earlier, but these talks are being recorded, and then um, so we can go back and the audience come back and <laughs> listen to 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 what you showed us today. Uh, we haven't received any questions yet, but in the interest of time, um, then we won't. Um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to say this is this is a really interesting approach that you have, and I think it would be great once you can uh, disseminate this uh, uh, protocol further, and then everyone can, can hopefully um, use them as well. So we're going to move on then. Uh, like I said, if anything comes, uh, I will pass it on to, to Monica, uh, but we're going to move on to, um, to our last speaker um, while he prepares uh, to share his screen. Then I'll give an introduction. It's uh, Professor Chao Wang, uh, who got his bachelor degree in chemical engineering at Tsinghua University in China in 2007. Then he obtained uh, his PhD in polymer chemistry from the same institution in 2011. And then from 2011 to 2014, he worked as a postdoctoral sorry, postdoctoral researcher uh, in the chemical engineering department of Stanford University. And after that, he joined uh, the University of California, Riverside, as an assistant professor of chemistry. Since 2018, he, he's been working as an associate professor at the chemistry department of Tsinghua University, and his uh, research direction are focused on um, mechanically st stretchable and healable electronic polymers for stretchable electronics and high-performance energy storage devices. Um, so as you can hear, his talk is a little bit more focused on materials. And the title is Water Stable and Self-Healing Ion Conducting Elastomers for Electronics and Energy Storage. Thank you, Chao. The floor is now all yours. OK, OK. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so uh, uh, hi, everyone. This is Chao Wang from Tsinghua University. And, uh, and today, I would like to talk a little bit about um, the recent research on self-healing electroactive elastomers for aquatic environments. And I would like to thank the organizer. And uh, so my, my talk will be a little bit like different. So it's kind of like material chemistry, but we'll see that how chemistry is so strong and to um, affect the me mechanical property and the electronic property of the polymer materials. Yeah, so I think my group in the past few years and we have been focusing on one key fundamental challenge that is how we can combine mechanical properties and electronic properties uh, in one polymer. So because when we see that, uh, we can see that, you know, the polymers are very different types. And, but in the polymer, 
you cannot always get mechanical properties and the electronic properties at the same time. And but why is that? You know, um, the key reason is because the structure of the polymers, for example, like a rubberies and also like a conventional plastics, it has very good mechanical properties, you know, and the mechanical stress is because and the mechanical stress and there was a lot of chain entangling inside. So under mechanical stress, the chain can have conformation changes and or the chain sliding in this way and they can dissipate the mechanical energy. So they can have very good mechanical properties. You can, you know, stretch it and come back as elastic. And I was thinking about like, uh, you know, electronic problem polymers, for example, like conducting polymers or kind of like ionic conducting polymers or semiconductive polymers because the, the chain chain kind of entangling is, is not that strong. And also conformation changes cannot be that, that much. And because you have a lot of, um, you know, conducting components inside. So they, let, they don't have sufficient energy dissipation. So under mechanical stress, this kind of materials can either, you know, be very weak or they will be very brittle in this case. So we have been proposed approach that is that you know we introduce many um, kinds of specially designed supramolecular non-covalent bonds into the polymer structure. So because the breaking of these non-covalent bonds can generate much stronger and much larger energy dissipation than simply the chain entangling. So in this case, we can using our specially designed like a non-covalent bonds, we own need a very tiny amount of these bonds and we add into the electroactive polymers so we can have sufficient energy dissipation and make the polymers have very good mechanical properties without disrupting its electronic properties. So in this way, we can combine the mechanical properties and the electronic properties in one polymer. And so just give you one example, like, you know, on how we can, when we talk about special design, the non-covalent bonds. So how can we say in that way? So we want this kind of non-covalent bonds and could be very dynamic and the mechanical stress at room temperature. To satisfy these requirements, and we will be, we will need the non-covalent bond to be, uh, you know, have a medium bonding constant to generate enough energy dissipation it has to be reversible at room temperature. But a very interesting thing is it has to be multiple, multi-directional, which means if it's just a single direction, so uh, upon stretching, it will not be easy to break. That would be something very important. And uh, with this kind of design, and we can have the polymer at the same time, have very good mechanical and electronic properties, we'll be able to generate many unique devices and many unique applications. And I will show you later in the slides. And I will start from like one, you know, um, kind of like dynamic bonds design to give you an impression how we can get a, a kind of dynamic bond. Because we know that metal ligand coordination and could be very strong or could be very, you know, dynamic, but it could not be at the same time very strong and very dynamic. So here's this design we have, and we actually combine um, three different kinds of bonding sites here. So we have strong, we have weak, we have medium bonding sites. And we combine them together, like into one metal ligand coordination. So you see, when you see this bond, and you see it's very interesting because, and uh, so it, it has 16 states. At the same time, it could be very stable. So 16 states. And so, which means this bond can be, you know, rotate and, you know, breaking and come back in a very easy way. So it has, although it's very strong and it has, because it has multiple like bonding sites, but at the same time it's dynamic. So upon mechanical direction, the stress and it could be breaking and combine, combine together in a very fast mode. So what could bring to the polymers, you will see like this polymer, when we combine this, uh, you know, uh, dynamic, metal in coordination into the polymer. We can get a very interesting polymer. This polymer can be stretched to 100 times of its original length without breaking. And when you release it, and it will come back. If you, if you are familiar with the silicon rubber, you will know that the conventional silicon can be stretched only like two to three times. 
but all polymer can be stretched one 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 hundred times. So it's very unique and uh, very interesting. It can also be self healable when you cut it and put it back, and it can be able to self heal because it's bonds and they can break and combine and very quickly. And so that's the you can see the power of this dynamic bonds. And then we want to find some other like dynamic bonds. So iron dipole interaction makes us very interesting because the iron dipole interaction is actually a kind of very weak interaction between or, or like, you know, or kind of uh, ions and the cations with the dipole. And this interaction has been discovered, you know, um, in 1960s. And uh, however, it's never been used to construct kind of polymer materials because it's so weak. But we find it very interesting because it could be, it's very dynamic. Firstly, it's very dynamic and it's multi-directional. And uh, also it's very interesting because one of the building block actually has an ion inside. In this way, we can bring the ionic conductivity into the building blocks and to make the polymer material to have ionic conductivities. So we designed a very interesting polymer. And this one, you can see the polymer it has, and um, you can have uh, a lot of dipoles on the polymer. And so we use a, a cation, and this cation is actually, a, 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 it's, it's a, a ionic liquid. And uh, because we, when the polymer chain has so many strong dipoles on it, it has a you know, multivalent effect. In this way, we can make the ion dipole interaction much stronger. And also because, and this uh, two, so many, so many ion dipole interactions when they come together, and we can make a very good materials. So that's what we do, and we design the polymer materials, and then you can see that. We obtain the polymer. It's actually a kind of very transparent polymer. At the same time, it's highly stretchable and it can be stretched 50 times of its original length. So it's transparent and highly stretchable and it's also self healable. When we cut it and put it back and it can heal its mechanical properties and it can see its uh, high stretchability. So, and uh, since it's ionic conductive and transparent, we can make it into a very, some very interesting applications. For example, we can make an artificial muscle. It's kind of a transparent artificial muscle using the ionic conductivities. We can see that under voltage and this artificial muscle and actually can expand and the voltage. And the very interesting thing is that because it is self-healable. So because we know that artificial muscle, the soft robots, the major problem is that, you know, and the, and the mechanical damage, it will just, you know, it will just be broken. Just to give you one example. Here is the traditional kind of, you know, um, the uh, artificial muscle. You can see that when you have a scratch and the work a few cycles and then it's broken. So it cannot work again. And so me, making the lifetime will be very short. So, but you can see like, you know, this one is a traditional and see our, like, you know, um, uh, kind of artificial muscle, we can see that use our material. And we also have the scissor and to have a cart. And we leave it there. And after 24 hours, although you can see scars, but you can see that the mechanical properties and the electronic properties have been healed. So this artificial muscle also have the self healing capabilities. And uh, so that's how we can use the iron depot interaction to get a very interesting kind of, you know, materials and also the ionic conducting materials and the devices. And we've become very interesting about the deep sea because, and um, while I was doing my postdoc and uh, everyone was talking about supermolecular polymers or they are talking about self heating polymers, their impression is that, you know, they are not stable, especially under moisture. The key reason is because most of the non-covalent bonds, they will you know, interact with auto molecules because auto molecular is a very good uh, hydrogen bonding donor and acceptor. So, like a metal ligand coordination or the dynamic like a hydrogen bonds, they are or like you know the 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 charge the charges like you know interactions, they are all not stable. Not now they are stable, you know, under moisture. But we're thinking like you know if we can have a material and it's very stable in the deep sea, in the water, and we'll be able to construct, have very interesting applications because when we have the, a lot of diving, people are diving and people have, some have kind of like, you know, kind of equipment and they dive into the sea. 
and when that's a meet with some urgent the conditions self-healing can bring then a lot of you know kind of they save a lot of lives and we can also have some electronics in the sea without any encapsulation that could also have many like important applications so thinking about that one so we are thinking can we really realize the electronic property devices that can work in the deep sea so the problem is that you know it's always about the problem itself so how can we really design a water stable dynamic non-covalent bonds that one would be something like you know very interesting but very difficult so uh, we start to explore that one starting from 2018 at that time we know we want to find some very stable non-covalent interactions so we first think about it for fluorinated polymers because we know that in fluorinated polymers we have a lot of dipoles in it in it so the dipole dipole interactions and we will tune the interactions and we will tune the crystalline domains and we we tune the structures and we are able to make the, the polymers it's very hydrophobic so i think the the dipole dipole interaction between the fluorinated polymers would be very stable underwater and that's indeed what we do is that we indeed get the first polymer that could be very stable underwater and could be you know and uh, you can live in the water and cut in the water and heal in the water and have the very good mechanical property as well over there however this material you know this is the first one and uh, and uh, it's very expensive because so many like a uh, fluorinated polymer inside and also the the something not good is that you know and the healing is a little bit slow because in the deep sea and we'll sit here for a few hours that's that's not acceptable at the same time you know the heating can only have like 30 to 40 percent so we are thinking can we make the underwater the the polymer materials can be have better properties good mechanical properties and faster heating speed and it can compare with the conventional structural materials so then we try to find some other kind of you know non-covalent interaction then we realize that we don't need to be from related polymers a lot of like divide forces you can see that on the ester could also be stable like you know in the in the water and we test it and real really find out that okay this kind of interaction because it's hydrophobic so the double double interactions and the divide forces can also be very stable and when we design the polymer we also add some um the pi pi stacking domains inside to have the nano phase separation so in this in this way when we tune the polymer in this way we can design the polymer has very good property you can see that it's very steep and its modulus is about 80 48 megapascal so it's it's comparable with actually very hard plastics you can see from here and that you can sustain 1000 times of the weight of the of the the, the of like polymer ball itself and without any you know like uh, the, the shape changes and you can use a hammer to to just uh, to do that and you create could rebound very fast even the polymer very stiff it's just very like hard plastic but it has many interesting properties is that you know it can be healed really fast if you can see that you know this polymer because conventional polymers if you go on to heal generally take hours but see our polymer because when we design that one and the chain could be very you know kind of like flexible so the polymer is actually the heating speed is very fast as you can see here that within 10 seconds you can cut it put it back like in 10 seconds it can already be stretched to five times of its length and within like five minutes 80 percent of the mechanical property has been already been healed which means that the polymer at the same time is very the material is very it's very stiff but at the same time they have very fast healing property and this is the the kind of because of our the, the dynamic bonds inside the divide forces could be very dynamic and make the heating really really very efficient and the, we, we see that one and this is not only in the air but in the water is the same and the, in water we can also you know only a few seconds it can fully heal like you know like 30 to 40 percent of its mechanical properties but it's all very good because you know you can see that you know just the five minutes you know it can already heal like 80 percent no matter you see in exit conditions basic conditions or the soil conditions in all the harsh conditions the material can be very stable and very hot very fast healing speed 
So we think like it's very important for some applications here. So for example, like when you're diving, right? So, and because it's so strong and can be used as a diving tube. And when there's uh, some leakage or unexpected card was scratch, and you can just press it for a few seconds and then the leakage could be stopped. That would be very important to um, for some urgent conditions to save the lives of the divers. So that would be like, you know, some like a magazine that's very interesting. And they just, you know, um, a lot of you know, high school students just write to me and about it. So it's very interesting about this one. Yeah. And, but you know, and the, we have the, the, the materials, but it's, it's still not like, you know, we are thinking about, can we just move one more step to make the devices to be the, the same property? So we come back to see like, you know, can we make an ionic conductor that is fully, you know, stable underwater? Because, but you know, it's very difficult because when we think about ionic conductors or, you know, kind of, kind of like the source is always would be dissolvable in water because water is so polar. And uh, so we are trying to find whether that's some kind of like ionic, um, ionic ion dipole interaction that could be stable underwater. So we use the DFT to calculation to see that one. And we realized that, and we just calculate like 60 times of different kind of ion dipole interactions using the DFT. And then we realized that, you know, when we combine specific kind of the, the K-lines and with the dipoles, as well as the contines, we can have a very stable ion dipole interaction in water environments. So we can see this one, the, the, if you can see the conditions here, we realize that you know, we when we change the OTF contine into the TFSI contines, we can have a very stable ion dipole interactions in water. So having this one, and then we continue to make a, a, a materials to combine this ion dipole interactions and into make a ionic conductor. And this ionic conductor is very interesting. It's very transparent. And you can use the ionic conductor and put it underwater to conduct the, to conduct and it has electronic properties. You can just work in the seawater without any encapsulation. So it's a fully stable, like can work in the water without any encapsulation. At the same time, it's highly transparent, it's healable. So you can cut it and put it back and it can recover its mechanical and the electronic properties. So in this one, we can have said many interesting things, for example, because it had the electronic properties, we can make a, a touch screen and we can put it underwater. Normally the touch screen and the, when we have water, you cannot use it, but our touch screen, because it, it's because of forces and you can just, uh, just draw the pictures underwater. And you can also use this touch screen and to play the video games and uh, but most importantly, you can see that this video game on and with our electronic conduct our conductor is fully stretchable and transparent and heatable. When you cut it, it can fully come back. Yeah, uh, bad skills, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we come to one more step and we will see whether we can have some opto, opto electronic properties into the material as well. So, and we want to find the ion dipole interaction for some other materials. For example, like we find something very interesting is the postcard materials. There are many like, you know, kind of, um, you know, luminescent like postcard materials. But the very bad thing is that, you know, this postcard, postcard like luminescent materials, they could be very unstable in the moisture because of the water like uh, penetration. And so, and our problem actually, because when we see the postcard, because we find out that it's also a kind of uh, cations. So we are thinking whether we can use a polymer and at the same time, it has very strong dipoles and use this polymer here, use a strong dipoles and use the dipoles, ion dipole interactions to protect the materials and without the, the water uh, attraction. So in this way, we're able to make a very water stable luminescent elastomers. And we use the ion dipole interaction and we combine these materials and the, then we can find out that this material actually like uh, use the ion dipole interaction because the postcard material can be very stable. And uh, also the polymer material itself can generate the very like elastic property. You can see that we can stretch to 13 times and uh, of the material can roll it, it's, it's very stretchable. And it can withstand all different deformations and without disrupting its 
optoelectronic properties. And uh, very interestingly is that, you know, this kind of luminescent rubber at the same time could be subhealable because of the dipole-dipole interactions and ion-dipole interaction inside. And uh, very interestingly, even with the guide kind of like uh, optoelectronic materials inside, the material could be very stable underwater and it could even self-heal underwater. You can see here, and we have the rubber and we cut it and put it back. It could be self-healable like uh, within like 24 hours. And with this one, uh, we are able to make some interesting thing because we can make some clothes. And uh, so this is what we do that my students and you know, they are just to code this kind of materials onto the, the conventional, conventional clothes. You can see that and then so they can make a you know, numerescent the clothes. And this clothes are actually without withstand the, the, you know, the washing here. You can wash it, you can put it here and push it directly, put it directly into the, the machine wash. And after machine washing, and you can see that the clothes is still very stable and its mechanical properties are very good and its optoelectronic properties could also be very nice. And that's how we can make a kind of very stable and luminescent kind of rubber and into the sea conditions. And um, we finally like, you know, and we'd like to share that, you know, how we can strengthen the mechanical properties of the ion conductor without sacrificing its electronic properties. So here's just one example. We further want to make the material become stronger. So we use a, a enhanced ion dipole, motivating ion dipole interaction. So what we do is that, you know, we combine with two cation together. And in this way, and so the, the ion dipole interactions could be much stronger. In this way, and we can get a material that is super, like, you know, um, it uh, is very strong and has three times um, increase in the mechanical properties without sacrificing any electronic properties. So from this example, I hope like you can see that actually when we tune the ion dipole interactions as well as many different non-covalent interactions, we can have some very interesting kind of mechanically and electronic polymer polymers and can use in many different applications. Uh, so to summarize here, so that you know, um, we would like to, to show you the takeaway messages that you know, by tuning the non-covalent interaction and uh, we can readily like tune the mechanical and the electronic properties of the polymers. And at the same time, this polymer can be used in many applications. Today, I'm sorry, I don't have time to show you the application in energy storage and also some other many like uh, optoelectronics. But you will see that, that you know, this power of the supermolecular chemistry as well as the you know, non-covalent bonds. Um, finally, I would like to thank my students and my uh, collaborators and of course the funding support. And thanks for your time, yeah. Thank you, Tao, very much. I'm sorry we couldn't see all the applications, but it's, I mean, what you've shown is already very exciting. Uh, it's very exciting developments for uh, self-healing materials. Uh, we have one question uh, from Professor Naumov. He's saying, uh, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering if the values for uh, healing efficiency are normalized over the contact area between the fragments. Uh... Yeah, so, so um, the question is regarding the heating efficiency. So what we calculate is that, you know, um, uh, indeed, you know, for, for different, um, different contact area and uh, the heating efficiency potentially could have some um, differences, but we use just a standard samples. So the, and it's one millimeter thick and, uh, and the, the width is actually like, you know, typically it would be like around like a one centimeter so that's what we use actually, but it would make it make it the thicker, and the, the heating probably could even be better. Um, so here's the thing: the heating efficiency we actually calculate is by the, the toughness. So before and after, and the, the the toughness, the percentage of the toughness heating. And indeed, you know, um, theoretically, you know, um, different areas, contact areas, should not 
make so much. I mean, the, the I mean, it really depends on how much you can make your sample, like uh, get in touch with uh, with it better. But uh, we here, because the heating efficiency is so high, we didn't really like, you know, care, like, you know, check uh, how much area was really, really getting in contact. But we believe that, you know, um, um, we, we just calculate use the, the original area. So we don't use a contact area. Yeah. Okay. To make it simple. That's, that's my answer. Yeah. But okay. if you have, want some technical details, we can just discuss afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in. So at this point, then I would like to thank all of our speakers uh, for joining us today. Or I would like to thank our audience. Uh, also my colleagues from uh, Chemistry European Journal, my colleague uh, Ananias, who was also supporting in the background. And before you go, I would just like to share um, one announcement for our next, um, for our next session of the Meet the Early Career uh, editorial advisory board of uh, chemistry european journal i hope you can see it now our next session will be on march 31st um, and it will be at a different kind of time zone so we'll do it uh, in the afternoon here in europe because we're one of our speakers is also in the us uh, so you you have their um the registration link if you take uh if you take your smartphones and take a photo of that and we will also be announcing this through our social media channel so we hope to see you there for our next session and with that i would like to thank you again and hope to see you soon